You're listening to Fox City's Murder and Mayhem, your bi-weekly dose of true crime history in a small rural community of Wisconsin. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Fox of Fox City's Murder and Mayhem. I'm Eric. I'm Gavin. And we don't do this podcast as often anymore, so I screw up the introduction. I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> Gavin is back. He promises us he's got a quick one for us today. Yes, it's a short one today. It's a good one? I I, I, I like that. All right, so where are we headed to? We're going to Kakana. We're Kakana? <laughs> yeah. Look at this. He's just He just keeps bringing out the Kakana episodes. <laughs> yeah. Is this one actually in Kakana, or is yeah. this just a person from Kakana? It is in Kakana. All right, take her away. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So we we tried to we tried to phase out Fox City's murder and mayhem, and then a couple of things happened. One, I found a batch of stories from Oshkosh and Green Bay, so I actually have a small little <laughs> backlog of stories left now. And then, weirdly coincidentally, I started getting invites <laughs> to things. Last night, from the day we we're recording here today, last night I went out and I did a presentation on a Fox City's Murder and Mayhem case that we've covered here and sold some books. Really good book buyers. Thank you to those people. <laughs> and then next week, it'll be in the past by the time you hear this, next week for us going out to uh, Sheboygan, actually Plymouth, and doing it again, telling telling a couple stories from the podcast. Strangely enough, after we tried to retire it, it's starting to catch on, um, maybe. It's taking on like wildfires. Maybe we should retire the Mafia podcast to see yeah. what happens after we do that. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, still, I I don't think that we have the time or the stories to bring it back full time. We'll definitely, it'll, we'll keep it going. We'll keep, yeah. it, we'll keep it on life support. And that was what, what was always kind of the intention. It of was. To, was to kind of keep it going because... Personally, this is my favorite podcast that we do. And so, and it you're not alone. I've heard that from other people too. That they obviously has. I don't think it has as wide of appeal. But for the people who do live in Northeast Wisconsin, it does tell some stories and some history that they probably don't know otherwise. So, yeah, and it's things that everybody should know. Really, some, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes yeah. you might not want to know it, but yeah. but I mean, it's also good to know that these things actually happen around you. Okay. So, so after that long introduction, introduction to this short episode. <laughs> all right. So this is this I'm calling this the shocking death of Arthur Esler. Okay. Which I don't even want to give a preview because I feel like that title <laughs> should, should kind of get, let you know where this is going. And, and if he gives you a preview, it probably would just end up being the entire podcast. So Yeah. <laughs> the Esler family was prominent in Kakana City history. I suppose some people would say it still is. They were among the earliest settlers in town. They were a French-Canadian family. They went on to have members of the family who were a fire chief, a training coach for the Chicago White Sox. They founded a school bus company. They were executives of a, a, a paper mill. I mean, they were all over the city history, like everywhere. I'm actually thinking of putting together like a series on this family because I'm like, I could tell the whole history of the city with just this family. <laughs> They're kind of amazing. Peter George Esler was himself a well-known man in Kukana. Uh, he worked at the Thilmany Mill and also had two decades with the city street department and also was a member of the volunteer fire department. He was well known around town. I mean, a thousand mill employees, city employees knew him. Mm -hmm. People with the fire department knew him. So people knew this guy. In 1908, at 35 years old, he married Catherine Killian, who was a widow. Together, they had two sons and a daughter, in addition to Catherine's children from her previous marriage. That's all fine and good. <laughs> <laughs> then, around 8.15 p.m., on September 30th, 1926, 14-year-old Arthur Esler, one of Peter's okay. children, who lived on Elm Street in Kakana, was playing a game called Run My Good Sheep Run with other boys. And I looked this up, and apparently it's kind of like a capture the, fra capture the flag sort of, a, sort of a game. Okay. He made a serious attempt to escape being caught. He climbed a 65-foot girder tower on the new Wisconsin Avenue bridge that connected the island with the Union Bag and Paper Mill. For people who don't know Kukana, this is like the center of town between the north and south side. It's very near 
the current Kakana library. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know Kakana at all, that'll mean nothing to you. If you kind of know Kakana, that'll give you an idea where we're talking here. Once he was partially up the tower, he crawled onto a beam and touched a high-tension power line, which shorted. Ooh! 12,000 volts entered his body. A flash occurred that was so bright it could be seen throughout the city. There was also a great noise. Arthur's clothes caught fire, and several holes were blown through his body as the power surged through him, including a large hole in his neck. Wow. Although he was probably killed instantly, the power caused his grip to become tighter, and he held firm to the girder for approximately three minutes before falling onto the bridge. His sister Pearl was on the bridge below. Their father was nearby at the home of Jacob Light, making a telephone call to Appleton, coincidentally, to check on the time for a funeral of a man named Frank Myers. Didn't want to be late for this funeral. (laughs) The bright light had Peter Essler look outside, and at that moment he realized he was going to be attending two funerals. Oh, wow. A doctor was summoned immediately, but it was already too late. The short caused the power to go out on Kakona's north side. The circuit connected to Little Shoot and Combined Locks as well, meaning they were also without power. Power was able to be restored to the north side and Little Shoot around midnight by rerouting the circuits. Combined Locks remained in the dark throughout the night. The paper mill there was forced to shut down and send countless employees home. An inquest was held in the office of Elliot Zekund, led by the coroner. Those who viewed the body at the mortuary in 2nd Street and then hearing witnesses were Henry Whitman, Frank Whitman, John Gerhardt, Julius Lindermuth, Martin Hermans, and Jacob Light. Their conclusion, death by accidental electrocution. Pretty straightforward there. Funeral was on Monday, October 4th. This is about five days later, with the Reverend of Holy Cross leading the procession and burial in Holy Cross Cemetery. A large group of students attended, as well as the newsboys from a local newsstand. So very short, very short story. Nothing really, no twists here, you know, no murders. Just a terrifying way to go, man. Yeah, it just really jumped out at me because the paper in general would really dramatize these accidents. I mean, people were dying in the paper mills all the time. And they would be very detailed in their description of how people died in the paper mills. (laughs) I mean, we could we could do an episode that would take an hour long where I just read the descriptions of how people die in paper mills. This one jumped out at me. One, because this is a 14-year-old boy, and they go into some detail about what happens when 12,000 volts oh, of electricity <laughs> go through your body. Yeah, and I believe that they make a statement to, about a hole in his head and stuff it, like that. Yeah, it, apparently it, it blew chunks out of him. Yeah, that's yeah. just awful. Yeah. That already caught my attention. Then, I, I'm, I'm sure getting electrocuted is not, like, super rare. The fact that this happened this dramatically, but then also the power out- outage, that's that blows my mind. I don't, I don't understand how electricity the, is wired up and everything like right. that. Like, I don't get that. But the fact that it's, it's where he was caused the power to go out on half a, in half a Kakana throughout Little Shoot and combined locks... Can you imagine that? The the whole night, you're sitting in the dark, you don't have power, and you're like, why don't I have power? And you find out it's because some boy got blown Blown up. up. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. You know, having to send a thousand mill workers home, like, hey, why why, why aren't the machines running? Oh, a little boy blew up. (laughs) That is crazy. So now, you said that this bridge, okay, is right by the library. Yeah. And now I'm I'm trying to envision this, because you're talking about him climbing up a tower. Yeah. I tried to to figure this out myself. And so today, today there's what's called the Veterans Memorial Bridge. Okay, that would... Which which is like, it's it's a lift bridge that goes up and down so boats can get through the canal. My guess is that this is there. Like, it wouldn't be the Veterans Memorial Bridge, because it wouldn't have been built yet. My guess is that's the spot. spot. And that's weird that it would wipe out the power on, because I'm trying to think, on the north side of town. And combine locks and you said little shoot? And little shoot. Yeah, because I could see how he could have grabbed a wire. Because you think about it, Kakana Utilities is right there. Right. So if he grabbed one of the primary lines that the power comes out of, I could see where you could take out a huge amount of 
Yeah, like I said, I don't, I definitely don't understand how like electrical circuits work based on the kind of damage he did. This must have been an area where it was close to the starting point. Yeah. Of like some of it goes to the south, some of it goes to the north. And he basically, he he stopped it at the source and just wiped out the whole north side. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. God, I wish I remembered, because you remember when the Memorial Bridge was built, right? I I wasn't there when it was built. I'm pretty sure, well, but we were, (laughs) it was built in our lifetime, I'm pretty sure. I don't think that's true. Really? I don't think so. Because I feel like I remember that bridge being built. I mean, maybe. I could be, I could be wrong. I I mean, it was early, early, early on. I I know there was a major remodel in like 1984. So maybe that's what. But I don't think it was new at that. Maybe it was. I don't think so, though. I think it was earlier than that. Now I'm going to sound like an idiot. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So I'm supposed to be the Kakana historian and I can't even tell you when the bridge was built. (laughs) Well, I mean, there's a lot of bridges in Kakana, man. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, for you to know the history of all of them. Yeah. But either way, no, that that bridge, that bridge was not there in the right, 20s, Chinese. not even close. Yeah, right. But I, I'm, I'm just like, I was thinking that that bridge, the Memorial Bridge had been built in our life. And it's, and, I guess and, it's possible. And then I'm like trying to remember what the old bridge looked like. But even if it was built in 84. The old, the old I, bridge actually didn't look that different. Okay. Like there was a lift bridge there before, which was very similar looking. The, I don't even know what you call it. The arms of the towers. I don't know what the terms are. They were like more skeletal looking. Okay. Like the current one's more solid. Okay. Yeah. But it was very similar. Like if you look at old photos, you can still tell that that's the same bridge, like the same spot, because it's like the same exact style of bridge. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, that's a, kind of a sad Kakana story. They're all sad, I should yeah. say. Yeah. But it's good to be back in Kakana. Yeah. On, on site, on mine. Yeah. And right next to Gavin's library, yeah. too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, I mean, it's a, it's a short one. There's no no major crime going on here. Definitely, I mean, it's a story that jumped out, and I thought it's worth telling. All right, well, that'll wrap this episode up then. We we said we are still kind of on in a limbo. We'll be trying to put out, at least a, I'm going to shoot for a new episode a month until at least Gavin gets through his his backlog now of all the different episodes he has. Yeah, yeah. you will still see some reruns popping up there just to get, enable us the time to get them all get everything recorded and stuff we'll continue to pump out new episodes yeah, I've of got this, a, so i've got a couple uh that are in near stages of completion actually sitting here just to give people a preview just sitting sitting near me here i have the story of the first oshkosh police department officer killed in the line of duty i don't know if that's going to be next time but just uh giving you a heads up that that is coming up i just out of curiosity when what era is that in it is in 1890. Okay. Yeah, 1890. Okay, so quite a while ago. I oh, was like, yeah. I, like, like, I was like, man, did it, was this somewhat recently? And it did the first time an Oshkosh police officer? No, no, no. It? This is a very, very old story. Yeah. All right. So then we will be back probably within within the next 30 days with a new episode. And until then, we can, we'll just continue dropping reruns for everybody to listen to. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Fox City's Murder and Mayhem. Join us in two weeks for another exciting episode of Murder and Mayhem.